There are moments in history that will always be tied to a specific memory, where you were. These are historical events that have changed the course of history. Moments that have altered the course of existence. My Nana always talks about where she was the day Kennedy was shot. I remember where I was, the day I discovered- <laughs> Video games had evolved and the 90s came out swinging. This decade had balls. Things were gross, weird, and violent. MTV advertised like this. Yeah. You like fun hair metal? Good, 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 yeah, fuck you. We got Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. And video games are no longer just cute and family friendly. Things like Night Trap, Doom, and of course, Mortal Kombat altered the narrative. Despite how tame things may look now, People lost their shit over these. There were congressional hearings, the creation of the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. All this did was make these games more popular. Which brings us to the year of our Lord, 1995, and history in the making. So let's gush, defend, and all around celebrate the over-the-top 90s classic, Mortal Kombat. I think most people either forget or just don't talk about how this isn't the same vibe that the first couple of games were about. Mortal Kombat basically invented its own tone in regards to the source material. I mean, New Line basically stated that they weren't making an adaptation of the video game, but an adaptation of the story the video game was based on. The games had black humor for sure, but, but things were mean and over the top. But with the movie, Anderson went a different route. He leaned into the fantasy and the humor. Mortal Kombat is what fantasy action looks like through the guise of 90s pop culture, a violent video game, and a major Hollywood studio. But for Mortal Kombat, how do you translate a game whose story was always a set dressing for fighting and gore? And maybe my Sega game was missing the booklet, but I don't remember the first two games especially going all in on an epic story. Uh, but even if they did, and maybe I was missing something, the games were really for fighting first and foremost. Anderson and Kevin Droney really gave their own spin and, and fleshed things out their own way. The mid-90s still had the remnants of the 80s macho boom, you know, only filtered through the changing times. Yet what I love the most is that we hadn't yet evolved quite enough to where things needed grounding. <laughs> I mean, look how everyone's introduced. Shang Tsung, played by Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa, murders Liu Kang's brother in this dark dream. And then we get introduced to Liu himself in some industrial dank setting with revenge on his mind. Bridget Wilson's Sonya Blade comes in like Ellen f***ing Ripley, beating down club patrons and taking fools out with her pump action shotgun. <laughs> then the Van Damme inspired Johnny Cage, played by the scene stealing Lyndon Ashby, who gives us that perfect Lionheart inspired 90s fight choreography, rounds things out, cementing our trio of heroes. It's clear that Anderson and company are giving us a labor of love and they have three unique and smart ways of setting everyone up. I mean, yeah, it's a little cheesy and over the top, but the 90s knew no other way. Where's Kango? Where is he? And even if they rush through the mythology, and they do, every main character is developed enough that you want to follow them on their combating journey. Christopher Lambert which I recently learned is pronounced Lambert, minus the uh, Midwest accent. Yet in my childhood, American trailers said this. Christopher Lambert. Listen, I'm too old to change now, but he is and will always be the man. Christopher mother Lambert. Raiden is the guide of sorts, preparing and coaching our team for what's to come and basically being the exposition dump for the audience. Sean Connery has actually offered the role first, <laughs> true story, but declined so he could play more golf which may be the most Scottish answer I've ever heard. Now, a lesser actor could have totally sank this character. I mean, hell, even a good one could have had issues. I mean, look at James Remar. He couldn't give Raiden the same presence, and I enjoy the guy's work. But Lambert took this sarcastic god, who, eh, for all intents and purposes, should be Asian, but uh, you gotta love the French. <laughs> they don't give a f 
And to be fair, the nationalities are all over the place in this movie. It was the 90s, and Twitter wasn't a thing. <laughs> And so Lambert took the role and made it his own. Without the casting of Lambert, you wouldn't have the heart. The Siddhartha-like ferryman to guide our trio physically and spiritually. Hell, he even puts his thumb on the scale when necessary. One thing Anderson doesn't get enough credit for is set design and location. When the great lead Robin show, I mean, this guy was the man in the 90s, shows up to avenge his brother's death, we get a gorgeous and real holy temple in Thailand's ancient capital. A lot was shot on location in Thailand, and believe me, it makes a difference to have actual locations populate your mystical movie. But when things were stage sets, they still had a unique look and design that gives Mortal Kombat a distinct feel. The dining hall, which I love because they could have organized it in a way where everyone would eat and have a space cleared for fights. But then just decided to dump all the food and drink on the ground uh, like it was a last minute decision. On Shang Tsung's island, somewhere there is a chef who is pretty pissed off. Not to mention the beauty that is Scorpion's lair, which ironically is not in the original script but added in reshoots. The fight is great, the fatality is unique, but damn, if this ain't the perfect mix of fantasy and horror. Now, this didn't have the same punch as the Jackie Chan films did of the same era, or if you compare it to something we have nowadays like The Raid, but back then, these were pretty great, and even used the famous wire foo before The Matrix helped make it a western staple of the time. Besides the iconic scorpion fight, Sonya Blade uses her thighs to break Kano's neck, and Shang Tsung got the classic spike pit to the chest. All memorable, all executed perfectly for what the movie was trying to achieve. All tied around the best casting choice of a bad guy to this day. Tagawa gets the credit he deserves, sure, but I'm here to heap a bunch more. His costume, tone, mannerisms. I mean, you don't strike gold this many times. Listen to his line delivery. It has begun. Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Deadliest of enemies, but slaves under my power. It has all the cadence and embellished style like he's on Broadway, but he holds himself physically like he's uh, just casually laying down the law. Tagawa is Shang Tsung. There seem to be rules in place, yet are just broken constantly, and it makes everything that much more fun. Like, we get a couple sanctioned beach fights, and Goro is pretty legit, but then Sub-Zero just tries to casually murder Liu Kang. The henchmen try to kill the whole group, and not once is there a form, bracket, or some sort of sign-up sheet on who is fighting who. And all of it comes full circle with the amazing and classic soundtrack. How hip and cool was Techno Syndrome? Now, I can't show much. YouTube. This soundtrack was everything. Of course, it's dated now, but even the film was wise enough to use the title song over and over. Of course, the immortals, Tracy Lords. Wait, what? Weird. I'm blowing this joint. The character designs are pretty authentic without the need to, uh, X Men them up. While everyone's intro is pop culture memorable, it may not mean much to the people who didn't see this when it came out, but man, Scorpion and Sub-Zero's entrance is still one of the most oh shit moments in movie history. Got that radio handy? A product of its time that once again proves that the 90s just don't get the credit it deserves and somehow didn't receive much blowback from the fan base, and actually hails as one of the very few to be adopted by it. Kano was Japanese American before this came out, and ever since. I love punctuality in a woman. Hey! Do not pester me or I will cut your hearts out like I did to that bitch of a partner of yours. Kano wins. It's like a mirror reflecting the past. Which brings me back to where we began, reminiscing thinking about a 10-year-old me, watching Mortal Kombat in theaters, the magic of being blown away. And now as a man with gray in his beard, I can appreciate the oddities, the vibrant bright colors, the fun creative decisions, and the innocence that comes with being one of the earliest adaptations of its kind. Yes, 
Mortal Kombat is showing its age. What was once cool does come off more like schlock, but you can't stop the aging process. You could only age gracefully. And so Mortal Kombat has to exist purely in the context of a simpler time. What sticks out most is the energetic and likable cast that carries it all. Sho had a physical presence that others have yet to match in the role. Wilson is believably badass with a likable bite. Ashby is naturally engaging with flawless comedic timing. Tagawa did so well that he became the Connery of Shang Tsung. Every actor who ends up playing the role will be compared to him for the rest of time. Plus, we got the Highlander, the God of Thunder, played by an American-born French king himself, motherfucking Lambert. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.